Let me again say hello to you, and let me welcome you to Uplift and to the conversation. I thought, as we start, we could talk about Jude. Not the Jude of the Beatles song, though. Not the, not the, not the Jude of uh, the song, Hey Jude, which Paul McCartney wrote for uh, John Lennon's son. But this is the Jude of the New Testament, and you're probably wondering, of all the things that we could talk about, why is it that one? Well, I'm going to tell you in just a few minutes, but first I want to start with a crash course on Jude, because I think getting to know Jude a little bit is going to help us get to know exactly what he said in his letter. It's going to give us some insight. So I've got about seven things. You're going to go real fast about what I think we should know about Jude. Here's the first one. He's the half-brother of Jesus. Jude is the half-brother of Jesus. Now, Jude did not tell us this, but he did write that he was the brother of James. Look at the first verse of his letter from Jude, a slave of Jesus Christ and a brother of of James. Now, Jude assumed that his audience knew James, that's why I put it in there, because James was the leader of the Jerusalem church, and he was a man of high repute. We also know that James was the half-brother of Jesus. So Jude, introducing himself as James' brother, gave him some peripheral credibility. He had authority to speak on spiritual matters without using undue influence. That's the first thing. Here's the second thing. Jude was one of five brothers. Can you imagine that house growing up? In fact, we hear of James and Jude together in Mark chapter 6, verse 3. Let me give you the context of this. Mark is detailing a contentious conversation between Jesus and his critics, and his critics insult Jesus. And in that insult, we find some critical information about Jesus' family. This is it. Isn't Jesus the carpenter? This is the insult. The son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph, Judas and Simon, and aren't his sisters here with us? Now, it's an insult here, by the way. Let me tell you why. Because Joseph isn't referred to. Generally, men were referred to as the son of their father. But the fact that Joseph isn't mentioned in the insult means there's some sort of undercover insult here. That That's... uh, We don't really know about his dad, but we know his mom. But in that insult, we get some information about his family. We learn that Jesus grew up with at least four half-brothers. Jude grew up with Jesus. They shared core childhood memories. Now, here's something kind of cool. Mark wrote their names in the Greek language. But in the Hebrew language of Jesus' family, this was the language that Mary would have used to name her children and the language and the names she would have used when she would have called her boys in the middle of the afternoon. I want to I show you the difference between the Greek version of these names and the Hebrew version. I got a little chart for you. So in Greek, we hear Jesus, but in Hebrew, J- Jesus' name was Joshua. James was the Greek name of of the Hebrew Jacob. Joseph was the Greek name of the Hebrew Joseph. Jude was the Greek name of the Hebrew Judah. And Simon was the Greek name of the Hebrew Simeon. Now, you're going to notice, especially in the Hebrew column, that these names are names of power and heritage and legacy. They're names of faith. They're the names of heroes. Which tells us the third thing I think we need to know about Jude that his family was absolutely devoted to God and God's people. Mary and Joseph obviously had a rich, deep belief in the history and the faith of Israel, and it's evident in how they named their children. Here's the fourth thing we need to know about Jude. We need to know that Jude did not consider his family relationship with Jesus as something to earn him credibility. Now, we've already talked about this. We've already seen this in the way that he introduced himself in the letter, but there's actually another way we can know this. And this is from an early church father. Now, the church fathers, that's a, that's a phrase, that's a name of a lot of writers who wrote about the emerging Christian faith in the first couple of hundred years after Jesus' resurrection. They're just called church fathers. One of them, his name is Clement of Alexandria. And he wrote something about Jude about a hundred years after the letter that Jude wrote was written. 
And he wrote about Jude's reluctance to identify him as Jesus' brother. Listen to Clement's quote. Jude, the brother of the sons of Joseph and very religious, while knowing the near relationship of the Lord, yet did not say that he himself was his brother. But what did he say? Jude, a slave of Jesus Christ, of him as Lord. What's interesting about Jude is that he would have rather called himself a slave to Jesus than a brother of Jesus. Which leads us to the fifth thing that we need to know about Jude. Prior to Jesus' resurrection, Jude and his brothers did not believe Jesus to be the Messiah. In fact, to give you a little insight into the family dynamics, they actually tried to capitalize on Jesus' miracle-working abilities. This is from John 7. By trying to convince him to go to Jerusalem, to the Feast of Tabernacles, and to step into his celebrity status by performing miracles on a larger scale for a much larger audience. Listen to this, this, these family dynamics from John chapter 7. This is what the brothers said to Jesus. Leave Galilee. This is in verse 3. And go to Judea so that your disciples there may see the works that you do, because no one who wants to become a public figure acts in secret. Since you're doing these things, show yourselves to the world. For even his own brothers did not believe in him. In other words, there's, just a, there's not a lot of reverence for Jesus as the Messiah here. They didn't, they didn't believe in him. Yet after Jesus' resurrection, Jude gathered with Jesus' disciples before Pentecost. Look in Acts chapter 1, verse 14. All of these, with one accord, all of Jesus' disciples were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and look at this, and his brothers, and his brothers. Jude finally believed. Here's the sixth thing. Sixth thing. Jude, along with his brothers, were actually early missionaries and church planters. Now, we actually learned this from Paul. You might not have ever known this. This is from 1 Corinthians chapter 9, where Paul is defending himself. This is what he wrote. Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not the result of my work in the Lord, even though I may not be an apostle to others? Surely I'm an apostle to you, for you're the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. This is my defense to those who sit in judgment on me. Don't we have the right to food and drink? Don't we have the right to take a believing wife along with us, as do the other apostles and the Lord's brothers in Cephas? I, I don't know if you caught that. There's, a, there's the pronoun we in that statement. Paul considered himself and Jesus' brothers among a group of traveling evangelists and church planters and missionaries. James and Jude and Joseph and Simon did what Paul did. We just happen to have more information about Paul. But in Paul's defense, he's saying, look, I do exactly what Jesus' brothers do. We have the same right. And just imagine, just use your imagination for a minute. Imagine Jude's testimony about Jesus in villages and countrysides. I mean, he lived with Jesus. He grew up with Jesus. He could tell all the intimate stories about Jesus. He could say that he doubted him, that he watched him die, that he saw him resurrected, and that he believed. Can you imagine that kind of sermon from Jude? What an amazing statement. Here's the seventh thing I think we need to know about Jude. And it comes from another early church father whose name is Eusebius. And Eusebius tells a story about Jude's grandsons. He says that Jude's grandsons were brought before the Roman emperor Domitian. Now Domitian had intentions of destroying the line of King David. Jude was a part of that. So when Domitian asked Jude's grandsons of their financial status, he wanted to know if they were worthy of killing. They replied, we're just poor farmers. And Domitian found nothing in them, even threatening at all. And this is what he called them. The emperor of Rome called 
Jude's grandsons, simple folk. Simple folk. So the seventh thing we know about Jude, might be a little bit of a stretch, but I think you can buy it, is that Jude actually passed on a legacy of humility and service. His grandsons even inherited it. Seven items there that I think lend a lot of credibility to the single page of Jude's letter in just a few sentences he wrote. And here's why. Because something bothered Jude. Something bothered him. Now, Jude, this is the man who didn't initially believe his own brother was the Messiah. He felt sibling tension. He tried to capitalize on Jesus' celebrity, who was probably ultimately embarrassed by his brother's crucifixion, but who witnessed the resurrection. He spent the rest of his life traveling from city to city to tell the world that his brother was the son of God and that he was a slave, that he was the savior of the world. Jude felt a pressing need to share these few sentences. And if something bothered Jude, who obviously glaringly went from disbelief to belief, I think it should bother us. So I want us to listen to the words of Jesus' half-brother from verses 3 and 4 of Jude's letter. Here's what he wrote. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation. Ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. What bothered Jude actually caused him to change the very course of his letter. He had intended to write what seemingly was going to be an encouraging letter about their common salvation. But mid-sentence, mid-thought, he changed his mind and turned his attention in this letter to what bothered him. And it was this, that the followers of Jesus, the church, had been infiltrated. Actually, later in his letter in verse 12, Jude gave a frightening description of the infiltrators. Let me show you what he wrote. He called them hidden reefs at your love fests. Now, those are interesting words. Let me kind of tell you what that means. It's very rich. These certain people, these ungodly people, Jude said, are like hidden rocks beneath the water that are dangerous to unsuspecting ships. They are an invisible danger. They're capable of sinking and destroying lives. And these people, they're present at the communion meals of the early church. That's what love feasts were called. The commun- these people are there. They're not on the fringe. They don't cast stones on social media. They're in the mix of God's people. They have infiltrated the church. A couple of years ago, the magazine The Atlantic published an article by staff writer Tim Alberta. It was pretty interesting. The article was called How Politics Poisoned the Evangelical Church. I read it. The article described the push and pull between a couple of different ministers in two different churches in Michigan. And one of the ministers, during the pandemic, defied Michigan's lockdown orders. Remember all that stuff? Defied the lockdown orders on Easter Sunday in 2020 and met seemingly against the law and preached what this pastor, this minister believed to be 
against subver sub subversive and oppressive political decisions. And his church, that church, grew by a multiple of five, just exploded in attendance. Now, the other minister featured in the article was not of the same opinion, certainly more subdued, and instead spoke against what he called the combustible dynamics at play in local churches. So this article actually pits these two political churches together. They're both political. One is antagonistic with their political opinions, and the other is antagonistic against political opinions. Now, the article has some bias, but the point is pretty clear, and this is why I'm bringing this up to you, that in those two churches, politics infiltrated those places of worship and did great harm. Now, let's be honest about politics for a minute. In some ways, that can't be helped. I mean, our current era is fraught with politics. They, they, we, we talk about politics at every meal every, with family members. We talk about politics at work. But what struck me from the article was really this premise that however you view this opinion, the modern church, much like Jude's church, is suffering from infiltrators, from infiltration. And these infiltrators have done their damage. They brought into the church a wide array of opinions and theories that Paul called in his letter to the Galatians, he uses this phrase, another gospel, which are it's really no gospel at all. These theories of politics and progressive ideals and blurred lines of sexuality are, have infiltrated churches. And these are extremist views. Politics are a part of conversations in churches. So much so that churches now believe that each election could be the end of America or the salvation of America or the end of Christian ideals. In other words, the gospel doesn't seem to be enough anymore. That's the point. What's intriguing about this is that there is more data that actually supports this kind of infiltration. Let me show it to you. We're going to go back to 1975, a generation ago the church held a stabilizing force and influence in the lives of Americans. In fact, in 1975, more than two-thirds of Americans expressed a great deal or quite a lot of confidence in the church. Ten years later, 1985, organized religion led the charts as the most, as the most, Revered institution in American life. But today, only 37% of Americans have confidence in the church. And we've been privy to the news cycle of the past month where two pastors, ministers of two of the largest churches in America, have had to resign for sexual sin, undermining consistently people's trust in their local churches. The church is still suffering from infiltrators. Jude has more to say about these infiltrators, by the way, from verses 8 and 10 and 16. Let me read these to you. This is what he says. In the same way, on the strength of their dreams, these ungodly people pollute their own bodies. They reject authority. They heap abuse on celestial beings. These people slander whatever they don't understand. And the very things they do understand by instinct, as irrational animals do, will destroy them. These people are grumblers and fault finders. They follow their own evil desires. They boast about themselves and they flatter others for their own advantage. These are indictments against something that's pretty serious. I think these statements are helpful to us, though, because they let us see exactly why Jude wrote this letter. In fact, he tells us. Let's read it again. We've already read these verses. From verses 3 and 4 in Jude's letter. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you, here's the phrase, to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints, for certain people have crept in unnoticed. 
who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. Jude wrote to believers, to people like me and you, to encourage us to contend for the faith. And he used language that would have been common in athletic contests of his day. The faith is something to be struggled for. It's something to be fought for. And by the way, let's define the faith. It's the content of what we believe is true about Jesus. It's the gospel. It's worth defending, and it's something worth fighting for. That's what Jude says. Jude is calling the church to decisive action, to preserve and protect the faith and the teaching that we receive and to protect it against the infiltration of novelty. And he tells us that there are three ways to do this from verses 17 through 23. I want us to read this together. Listen to what Jude wrote. But you must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They said to you in the last time, there'll be scoffers following their ungodly passions. It is these who cause divisions, worldly people devoid of the Spirit, but you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. And have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. And to others, show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. You want to know how to contend for the faith this is it. Contending for the faith the first way, it's pretty simple. Expect infiltration. Expect it. Remember, he wrote, remember the predictions of the apostles. They said to you, in the last time there will be scoffers. It's coming. Contending for the faith, first of all, is an aversion to surprise. Infiltration, he wrote, is inevitable. It's what the apostles said. A church is filled with all kinds of people. And a percentage of those will always be those who have mixed their faith with novelty. Can you imagine, by the way, can you imagine the very first people who read the Gospel of Mark? Especially when Mark wrote out the list of Jesus' 12 apostles. Now, I'm telling you this because Mark was the first gospel of the four to be written. It was the very first written story of Jesus' life. Now, the people who read Mark, they never had access to the heritage of information you and I now know. They learned of the unfolding of Jesus' life and death as they read it. So when Mark wrote of Jesus' apostles, he included this description in chapter 3, Verse 19 of the final apostle. And Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Jesus' own circle was not immune to infiltration. It's healthy to expect it. That's the first way. Here's the second way to contend for the faith. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Listen again. Keep yourselves, Jude wrote, in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jude's already shared with us how this is possible, by the way. Listen to those to whom he addressed his letter in the very first sentence, to those who were called beloved in God, the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. We're called, we're loved, and we're kept. And I'm showing you that because they're all passive verbs. In other words, the people that Jude wrote to did nothing to earn this exceptional description. They didn't make themselves be called or make themselves be loved or make themselves be kept. It was done to them. God called them, loved them, and kept them. They're passive verbs. It's the same for us. We are called, loved, and kept. And there is nothing you could have done to have earned those descriptions. There's nothing. In verse 24, Jude wrote this, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling. Same idea, passive verb. God has a miraculous way to keep you in his love, even when you try to fall out of it. God does this for us. And Jude says, recognize this. You want to contend for the faith? Understand your security. But here, 
Let's be clear about this. We have a part to play. Look in verse, verses 20 and 21. Jude wrote, but you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God. Jude used a pretty common metaphor in the New Testament here. You've probably heard it from the letters of Paul. Build yourselves up. That phrase actually meant to participate in the building of the community of believers. Jude, Jude, does, Jude did not mean that you've got to fortify your personal faith. What he did mean is that we have to contribute to the fortification of the whole, to participate, engage in the community of faith, be an active participant and not a sideline spectator. Here's a third way we contend for the faith, and it's this. Show mercy. Show mercy to doubters. Show mercy. Verse 22, have mercy on those who doubt. And this might be the most critical for us. Because we all think we're pretty smart. And we are eager to tell people how right we are about a lot of things. But Jude says we're not, we're not called to be holy brawlers. That's not our calling. We're not called to arrogance. We're not called to be social media agitators. We aren't the antagonist of the movie. We're called to show mercy to the antagonists. We're called to show mercy to the agitators, the infiltrators. Show mercy on them. And to those who are swayed by and listen carefully as we kind of wrap this up. Showing mercy is not, it's not weakness. Showing mercy doesn't make you vulnerable. In fact, it takes maybe all of the self-control we can muster to show mercy to people, to be kind. But it is the action of the crucified God who could have called 10,000 angels in his retribution but instead chose suffering and forgiveness to show mercy. Listen, friends, believers, our faith in Jesus is worth fighting for. It's worth defending, but not with violence and arrogance and arguments. It's worth defending with mercy and grace and compassion. This is the way of Jude. And it's certainly the way of Jesus. Fight for the gospel, but fight the right way. That's the message of Jude.